In case you don't know me, my name is Kent Smith. I am the Associate Pastor of Discipleship here at Gowansville Baptist, and it is my great privilege to bring you the Word of God this morning and, and for the last time in this building in 2023. Pretty exciting. Uh, in the new year, one thing I want to mention is I'm going to have a Sunday school class, a short one. It's, it's going to be all of four weeks on discipleship in the home, daily discipleship. What can I do in, in my own house, in my day-to-day -day life, to grow in, in love for Christ, grow more like Him, lead my family, lead my spouse, uh, or really just grow myself so that I can better engage the, the culture and the people around me? And in that, uh, I'm not against bribery, so I'll be handing out all kinds of free stuff, all right? It's, it's going to be an intensely practical class. You will leave knowing not just what to do, but with the tools to do it, okay? So I would encourage you to come visit me. Uh, you'll, you'll see that in the bulletin, and I'll be talking all about it. I don't know about you, but when I look back on 2023, I say to myself, that is not how I thought that was going to go. I know that's especially true for some of us in this room. But I know that in, in one degree or another, it's true for all of us in this room. Uh, nonetheless, I praise God for his faithfulness in all of it. You know, my, my trials have been fewer than I deserve, and, and my blessings have been a great many more than I deserve. But right now, we're, we're coming up on just the, the final hours of 2023, and so if you're like me, then your, your thoughts are moving towards your plans, God willing, for 2024. Our thoughts move towards these, these great goals that we have for the year, these things that we want to change about ourselves, our habits, resolutions, we call them. Resolutions. Now, some resolutions are grander than others. Uh, like you have your, your average resolution, and then you have this resolution that to accomplish is, is really going to take a, a feat of superhuman strength, really. That's the, the span on resolutions. I'm not going to mention this person by name, uh, but one of you sitting here today has posted on Facebook recently that 2024 is going to be the year we, quote, are folding the clothes as soon as they come out of the dryer. <laughs> There's a caution in there about being Facebook friends with your pastor. <laughs> but whether that is an average resolution or the kind that takes superhuman strength, I'm not going to comment on because you all haven't seen my dryer. And so you, you, won't, you won't know how that affects me in, in my own heart. Um, but regardless of the actual resolution, whether we think it's a big one or it's a small one, we call them resolutions and we resolve to make them at this time because we acknowledge at the outset that if we're going to do these things, if these things are going to be accomplished, it's going to take resolve. It's going to take determination. It's going to take discipline, self-control. Well, these are unpopular words. unpopular words. I'm, I'm not talking about the fact that they're unpopular in our culture at large. I'm talking about the fact that they're unpopular in our church culture. Discipline and self-control have become something of dirty words in our churches. You know, heaven forbid you suggest discipline and self-control are things that Christians need in their spiritual life. You will get in trouble if you do that. It is perilous to do that. And so today, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to suggest to you that there are things Christians ought to do, and beyond that, it is good and right to employ discipline and self-control to accomplish. Christians should be people of resolve. But I would be willing to bet that if someone, let's, let's say me, were to walk in to any given church on any given Sunday and say, hey, guys, you need to do what best honors God, even if it isn't what you prefer to do. 
well, you wouldn't even be able to hear the sound of me getting thrown out that front door because they're going to say, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Because if we do something we don't want to do in the name of holiness, that will make us, who knows? Hypocrites, Pharisees, I heard legalists, and that's the word I'm going to zoom in on. Legalists. That's what they'll throw me out the door saying. They may even take the time to cite a verse like the one we had read in Galatians. Where, and, and, and they'll read that and they'll say, see, right here, we are set free to do whatever we want. You are just a legalistic Pharisee putting extra regulations on top of Scripture. And that right there, we need to pause and address today. Because if Kent is a legalistic Pharisee, you do not need to listen to a single word I say. But if, in fact, I am doing the job of a pastor, which is simply to take the word of God, lay it open in front of you, show you its truth, let the Holy Spirit convict you of sin in your life through that truth, well, then all of a sudden, Kent has very little to do with this, and it has everything to do with you and the Lord. I want to look at this idea of resolutions in the Christian life under three main points. As per usual, I try to be kind to my note takers. So if you're a note taker, here are the, the three points up front. We'll look first at the debate. Second, the new love. And then finally, the resolve. So that's debate love, and resolve. Now, characteristically, my first point is pretty long, my second point is not as long, and my third point is really short. So when we get to the third point, do not despair. We are not one, you know, one-third remaining, okay? So let's jump into the debate. This is the debate that we, we find ourselves in churches all around the country right now, and there are largely two groups involved in this. The first group is the one that just threw me out the front door, uh, you know, we're going to call that position license. License. Because in this view, we can essentially do anything, and it doesn't have an effect on our salvation. And so, because nothing we do has an effect on our salvation, we are thus given license to do whatever we please. Once saved, always saved. I have license to do what I want, and it doesn't matter. That's, that's kind of the the line of argumentation. And, and so no one can then say to me, you ought to be doing this, that, and the other thing because that infringes on my Christian freedom. And that's where the names like legalists start getting thrown out. Now this view is all over church culture. It's everywhere. And it makes sense because it pairs well with ideas like I'm my own spiritual authority, follow your heart, Truth is relative. I have my truth, you have your truth, and so we just live and let live sort of thing to each their own. And that has snuck from the culture into the church in degrees that I don't think we care to admit. But it is all around us. License is wonderfully compatible with the culture. And then there's the second group that license is kind of raging against in the debate. These people say, absolutely incorrect. That's not true. Your salvation actually depends on your works. So they're saying that what you do, you have to do in order to earn your salvation. Now that is legalism. That is textbook legalism. And they'll cite something like James chapter 2. Let's go to James chapter 2. It's a smaller book, but if you hit Hebrews, just keep going, you'll find James. James chapter 2, verse 14 says this. This is the ammunition of the legalist in the debate. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Go to verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. 
Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He expounds on that, gives examples. You go to verse 24. And so you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? And then here it is in 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now that legalistic view is less prominent today than it used to be. Again, because it's not compatible with the culture. You see a lot more of license running around. Um, license is, is what a seeker-sensitive church latches onto so they can be relatable to the culture. That's what they do. But this is the debate. There it is in front of you. You have license on one side. You have legalism on one side. The side of license says I can do whatever I want, independent of my salvation, and judge not lest ye be judged, you Pharisee. The other view says you must earn and keep your salvation through the works that you do. You must merit these things. Okay? Each one of these has a passage of Scripture that they lean on. And so if, if we only had that, right? If we only had these two passages of Scripture and those arguments, we might throw our hands up at that point and say, what do we do? One of these two sides must be right. Either one of them could be right. And forced to choose between this position or that position, people will do what they often do. They'll say the truth is somewhere in the middle. The truth is somewhere in the middle. You know, it's on a pendulum. Have you heard this? The pendulum swang to the left for many years, and now it's swinging to the right. But the truth, the goal, is in the middle of these two things. Sometimes that's true. A lot of times that's not and it is not true in this case. So I'm going to suggest something uh, that shouldn't be radical, but is. And you can write this real big in, in your notes. That debate, the debate between legalism and license, is a fallacy all on its own. It is meaningless, nonsensical, unchristian. I think any time that good Christians spend arguing amongst themselves on this debate of legalism versus license, and, and certainly trying to place an X somewhere on that spectrum about where the right balance between these two things is, is a waste of time. Neither one of these options is biblical. I want to illustrate that in terms of a relationship. You know, as Baptists, we say you need a relationship with God. That's, that's vocabulary we use quite often. So let's, let's use a relationship here as an example. Suppose we have a parent and a child. A parent and a child. The child says to their parent, hey, mom or dad, I, I want to go fishing. What do I have to do to have you take me fishing? And the parent responds with, well, that, I mean, that sounds great. I'd love to go fishing. I, I think if we just mow the lawn, then we'll be good to go and, and we can head out. And at that point, the child lets out the biggest sigh that you have ever heard. It's one, <sighs> fine, I'll mow the lawn. And they walk out the door, they slam it on the way, they kick the lawnmower to start it up. They race up and down the yard and they do a poor job at mowing the lawn. But you know what? It is technically mowed. And so they come back to their parent and they say, I did it, now take me fishing. Now you tell me, is that parent obligated to take that child fishing? Not should they, not is it within their right to do so, but must they? Are they contractually obligated to take that child fishing? Because he mowed the lawn and that was the deal. Anybody want to say yes? No, abso absolutely not. Right? And, and despite how quickly all of our, our head shaking uh, agrees on that, we all agree on that together, there would be people in this world that treat God just that same way. They do this. This is legalism. Legalism is trying to merit salvation. It's the thought that if I do this, 
God necessarily owes me this, regardless of my heart in it, regardless of my motives in it. I did this, he now owes me this. John MacArthur has a wonderful definition for legalism. He says it is offering God unacceptable worship and demanding that he accept it. Precarious position. I think too often when, when we think of legalists, we think of people that say, you know, if you want to go to heaven, that denim skirt had better touch the floor, right? And, and, and that's, that's what we picture. We conjure up these cartoons of, of legalists. I don't think that's true anymore. I think legalism can look a lot of different ways, and I think the main face of legalism is changing. It doesn't look like that anymore, but that's a sermon for a different time. So, this kid mows the lawn in hopes of contractually obligating his parents to take him fishing. That is what Paul is attacking in Galatians. That's what Paul is doing in Galatians, is attacking that exact thing. Now, license is equally as offensive. It is just as bad. Let's put it in our relationship scenario. Here, the child asks to go fishing again. Hey, I want to go fishing. And the parents say to the child, I'd love to go fishing with you. Mow the lawn and we'll head out. And this time, the child says this. I don't feel like mowing the lawn. And because you love me, you're going to take me fishing anyway. This is a sort of emotional abuse where the child is thinking selfishly, the child is thinking unlovingly, and then accusing the parent of being those things if they don't get just what they want in the way they want it. That's a one-way relationship. You must love me always. I will love you when I feel like it. This is what James is attacking in his letter. That's license. So now look at what we have just uncovered about these things, okay? Look at the relationship between legalism and license. They really aren't that different. License is just legalism turned inside out. It's the other side of the coin, where legalism says, I will do this, and God must love me. License says, I'm not going to do this, and God must love me. Neither one of these positions are good. They're both awful. And so I, I, I give the question to you. Think about that pendulum, right? Is the relationship that we are supposed to have with God somewhere between making contractual demands of him or an emotionally abusive relationship? I don't want to split the difference on those things. I'm not interested in that. And that's why Paul attacks legalism in Galatians. That is why James attacks license in his letter. At this point, you're thinking, okay, Kent, get to the point. Uh, what, what makes James and Paul compatible then? How do I reconcile these things? What's, what's the valid option that makes faith and works done in such a way that I'm not a legalist, nor am I depending on license? What do I do? It's fair. Let me give it to you in a word. Love. Love is the solution to that, and that's our second point. When a person is truly born again, when they become a genuine Christian, the Holy Spirit is beginning a work in their heart. And throughout the entirety of their life, the Christian is becoming a new creation through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why we call it being born again. That process, in theological, super nerdy terms, is sanctification. Sanctification. And we can see evidence of this work of sanctification in a person's life and heart as their desires shift away from the things of the world and shift to Christ and the things of Christ. They come to love Christ and the things of Christ more and more. And it is this change of heart 
this introduction into the heart of a love for Jesus Christ that reconciles faith and works. Because now what they do is they aim to please Christ and not themselves. That's the end of license. And they do that not out of obligation or trying to get God obligated, but they do it out of love. That's the end of legalism. The end of license and legalism, the death of them, is found right there in love. Love is so different than legalism or license. You see, legalism doesn't understand love. It doesn't get it. It lives in fear. Fear of not measuring up. Fear of not having God owe me enough when I finally meet Him. License may understand what love is, but it doesn't own it. License in and of itself is only selfishness and presumption, but it is not love. So let's put this back into our illustration of parent and child. Imagine this. The parent comes home from work and finds the lawn already mowed. And amazingly, maybe a few other things around the house that they were planning to do when they got home, already done. And when the parent asks the child why they did these things, the child says this, I know you work hard, and I wanted to show you that I really appreciate it. That I love you. Any parent would delightfully respond, let's go fishing. Because I love you too. There's no legalism or license in that, is there? That's just love demonstrated in this little act. Let me give one more example. It's my favorite. Young man, teenager, getting ready to go on his first real date to his first real nice restaurant with a young lady that he quite fancies. Now, if you've ever spent much time with a teenage boy, you may have detected through various senses they don't care much about hygiene. <laughs> Present company excluded, I'm sure. Yet on this day, on this day, he's brushing his teeth and flossing. He's putting on extra deodorant. His hair has not only been washed, it has been combed. <laughs> now what happened? What changed? Did he suddenly discover a love for hygiene? Instead of sleeping in? Does he love brushing his teeth now as opposed to watching TV? No! He doesn't love these things. He doesn't care about these things. He doesn't do them because he finds enjoyment in the act itself. He does them because now there is a greater love in his life than sleeping in. There is a greater love in his life than watching TV. He takes up these things that otherwise would be unimportant to him, uninteresting to him, and he does them carefully, and he does them joyfully, not because of any love for the task, but because of love for the person for whom the task is done. His affection for sleeping in and TV and video games have been pushed out of his heart by a newer, greater love. Thomas Chalmers calls this in relation to Christ. He says famously, this is the expulsive power of a new affection. Empties your heart of everything lesser. And when you understand that, the idea of the, the new birth and sanctification and the effect that has on the heart, now you understand Paul and James together. Both assume that the people they're writing to are Christians with the Holy Spirit, working a love for Christ in their hearts. And so one says, you don't need legalism in your life. And the other says, you don't need to fall into that trap of license. You're not anywhere on that spectrum anymore. Love has set you free from the possibility of legalism and license because now you can obey his commands out of love. The whole game changes. And Jesus taught this plainly, didn't he? 
Jesus said, if you love me, you will, what? Obey my commands. Love creates obedience. Not legalism, not license. Love creates obedience. And an amazing secret that you discover as as you go down this road is that obedience creates joy. Obedience creates joy. William Cowper, uh, I think you actually say it Cooper. I've always said it Cowper. Don't judge me. Um, I have the license to say that how I want. Uh, No, he, he wrote a few of my favorite hymns, okay? And he says this, To see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. That's what we're talking. Love changes all of it. You know, love never asks how high or how low the bar is set. It doesn't ask what the least I have to do is. Can you imagine that? Imagine this with me, just for a moment. What if, starting today, churches all around the country, Christians in in this church and everywhere else, began to ask not... What is the minimal acceptable to God? But instead, what is the best? What is the most pleasing thing that I can do for God? And then they went out and they did that thing regardless of how they felt about it. What would change? I think there'd be a revolution in our worship services. What we do in them. What we sing in them. I think there'd be a revolution in our personal priorities, a revolution in how we spend our time. Imagine the change that would occur if instead of trying to find where my interests and God's interests overlapped, I just completely denied myself altogether, picked up the cross, and followed Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. What if my life looked like that instead? I think many Christians have been given a faulty definition of legalism that scares them away from ever being resolved in their faith. Rather than being told legalism is trying to merit salvation, which is the right definition, they were taught instead that legalism is employing any sort of self-control towards the goal of personal holiness. That's what they were taught. They've been told that's what legalism is, that if you have to deny your desires, then you are being legalistic, and you ought not do that thing. The problem with that is it's not biblical. Turn with me to Titus 2. You're you're just going to back up in your Bibles a couple pages. You'll find Titus. It's just on the other side of Hebrews from James. Titus 2. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to read Titus 2, a large chunk of it. And while I do that, I want you all to keep track of how many times there's a call to be self-controlled or some kind of similar phrase. And remember that anti-legalist Paul that wrote Galatians? He wrote this. Same guy, writing both of these things, okay? So Titus 2, here we go. Keep, Keep count for me. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And here's that, what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in the faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants, that's slaves, are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, 
not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of our God and Savior. I don't think anyone can miss the call to be self-controlled in there. And notably, no one gets an exception. Paul hits every man and woman. Male, female, old, young, they're all commanded to be self-controlled. Now listen to this. This is, this is where things get revolutionary. Listen to the how in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And what does this grace do? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Grace that trains. A training grace. Grace training us to uh, uh, renounce ungodly passions. Biblical self-control is a gift of grace. It's grace. The ability to see sin for what it is, grace. The ability to deny yourself that sin, grace. Gifts from God that he uses to train us to become more like Christ. Boy, this is far from being legalism. Self-control, discipline, is actually a means of the Holy Spirit that he uses in our lives to grow us as Christians. It's not legalism, that's grace. And so you need to listen very carefully right now. Every Christian in this room, hear this. If you reject using the Spirit-enabled self-control in your life, you are rejecting the grace of God in your life. Say it one more time. If you reject using the Spirit-enabled self-control in your life, it is the grace of God you're rejecting in your life. Imagine this sad picture. A bird hatches in the nest. It sees other, bo- other birds out there. They're soaring. They're flying. They're, they're reaching these, these new heights. They're graceful, beautiful. And as it grows in the nest, it discovers that it too has wings. And that its wings have feathers. And it spreads them. And it begins to flap a little bit. And as it does that, an older bird, one nest over, says, Hey, whoa, what are you doing? You can't just flap your wings. That's legalism. Just sit in the nest. If God wants you to fly, you'll fly. And the younger bird says, well, well, okay, but how? And the older bird says, don't know, never flown. Don't want to be a legalist. Don't like the work of flapping my wings. Can't do it. I'll be a legalist. So I sit here. God, in his grace, has already given those birds the gift of flight. And if they would but claim it for themselves, they would be soaring. So too is the Christian that never uses the training grace of God that shows him sin. The training grace of God that gives him self-control. And so spends his whole life in the nest. Spends his whole life never finding spiritual maturity, never realizing the spiritual heights that he could soar to if he would just use the gifts that God has already given him. And that's the final point here, resolve. What I wouldn't give for everyone in this room to leave here today having taken this to heart having resolved in 2024 to be a Christian like the one in Titus 2. One that pursues holiness at all costs, even when it means employing his God-given self-control. I am worn out, tired and brokenhearted from seeing Christians go their whole spiritual walk without this and then be confused as to why their life looks the way it does. 
God gives them these means of grace like self-control and discipline and resolve, and they don't use it, and then they wonder why grace seems absent from their life. Now, right now, right now, parents, listen to this. Right now, the stats for kids who go to church every Sunday and were an active part of the youth group, four out of five leave the faith after their first year in college. Four out of five. Divorce rates in the church, not that different than divorce rates in the culture. It is hard to imagine that training grace produces the same results in marriage as those who are untrained in the culture at large. It is hard to imagine that training grace produces a parenting style where we lose four out of five of our own kids to the culture. I promise you that at the root of these and a thousand other things that plague our churches today is the fact that at some point we decided to take the grace of God that he calls self-control and we retitled it legalism so that we can just do the things we want to do rather than the things scripture tells us we ought to be doing. And that's what I find most of the time when the name legalist gets thrown at someone. That person, they don't know what legalism is. Ask them. Ask them to define it. They won't have an answer for you. It has nothing to do with meriting salvation or not. They just use this as a shield to keep doing what they want to do rather than what they ought to do. Because it sounds super spiritual. It's not. It is the rejection of God's grace. Maybe there's someone in here today and that's you. Be honest with yourself. That's that's how you use the term legalistic. Don't tell me to go to church every Sunday. That's legalistic. Don't tell me I need to be reading my Bible. That's legalistic. Don't tell me I need to redo my family schedule to prioritize Christ rather than sports or TV or whatever it is. That's legalistic. Listen to me. Someday, and this is why my heart aches about these things, Someday, you're going to stand before God and give an account of the time that you were given. And every instance of your using the term legalism as a smokescreen to do what you want rather than what you ought is only going to prove that it was never a lack of knowledge that kept you from doing these things. It was a lack of love for Jesus Christ. I'm not up here trying to be edgy. It's not who I am. I'm not trying to hurt feelings like that's something I enjoy. I don't. I'm up here trying to tell you what the Word of God says because in the last 18 months or so that I've been a part of this church family, I have grown to love you. And I cannot abide the thought of people going into 2024 resolving to do anything and everything except be a better Christian because someone once gave you a faulty definition of legalism. And then you spend your whole life in the nest. Now I want to see you soar. I want to see your marriages stronger than ever because they're marriages where the husband has resolved, resolved to use everything within him and around him to love his wife as Christ loved the church, and the wife has resolved to follow the leadership of her husband as the church follows Christ. I want men that are ruthless against sin. Satan throws a dart in your general direction, and you just go nuclear in response. I want to see your kids go to college, and instead of four out of five leaving the faith, six out of five stay in the church. Yeah, that's right, six out of five, because they go to college and they make more Christians. Because at one point in their life, their parents resolved to make Christ the center of their home, the center of their parenting, the center of their evenings, rather than a decoration around the edge of the week. I want to see men and women unfazed in their hearts by every whim of doctrine that comes blowing through and and devastating this, this church culture that has lost its identity And let's bad theology hurt it because these men and women instead have resolved that each day they're going to learn Christ's word, apply it in their lives, and be beacons of light for those people who get swept up in bad theology. 
I want to see my brothers and sisters of this church resolved to be done with a shallow Christianity that never changes their heart, never employs their self-control, and never saves them. I want to see you resolute in 2024 to finally soar as Christ has made you to soar. And don't let some faulty definition of legalism scare you from being a Titus II Christian. You can guard yourself against real legalism easy enough. I'll give you the secret to it. Uh, Let's say you don't want to read your Bible one morning, but you go ahead and you open it and you read it. Now, is that resolve or is that legalism? Here's how you can tell. Ask yourself, very simply, am I doing this right now to earn points with God so that he will let me into heaven? Or am I doing this because I know it pleases God when I study his word, and so I ought to, regardless of how I feel about it? Am I doing this because I want to prove to other people how righteous I am? Or am I doing this because I know I'm not righteous And so I recognize the importance of reading my Bible every day, whether I want to or not. Whatever the spiritual discipline that you resolve to take up, if you aren't doing it to earn your salvation or prove your own righteousness, I wouldn't spend any time fretting about legalism in it. I would just do it. Pray for a greater love for Christ so that it doesn't feel that way. Well, then press on. Press on. Maybe you're here and you don't know where to begin. You don't know what it looks like to make a Christian resolution or or what sort of thing you should be doing. I don't know how to lead my wife like Christ. Uh, I don't know how to strengthen my marriage. I I don't know how to lead my family towards Christ so that I can lay my head down at night and know I did my best for my kids. How do I do that? How can I grow as a Christian to better engage my friends, my family, my co-workers with the gospel? I mentioned a class that I was going to teach starting in the new year. You come to that class, okay? I'll teach you all about it. I'll give you the tools. I'll show you how. We'll practice it. And you can leave knowing how to do these things so that in 2024, you can be a Christian marked by resolve. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the, the clarity of your word, how it diffuses all senseless arguments points us towards the reality of of love for Jesus Christ. Lord, for all the tools that I can give people, I I can't give them a love for you. There may be one here today that hears me talking and they they think freedom is, is freedom to sin, freedom to do what they want. Lord, show them that this kind of Freedom is what you call slavery. That they're yet trapped in their sins, deceived by them. Desires that want the wrong things, Lord. Open their eyes to it. Show them what freedom looks like in Christ. Work in their hearts a love for you. And let today be the day they turn from sin and turn to Christ. See him for all he's worth. And go into 2024 Christian by your We ask these things for the glory of Jesus. Amen.